Do you ever wish you could just pick the brain of someone who's been in the music industry since, say, the 70s or the 80s? And maybe this person has their own commercial recording studio as well and has worked with thousands and thousands of artists, including the members of ACDC. Now, this might seem very Specific, that's because I actually was able to do this. I was able to interview my mentor and the owner of Unity Gain Recording Studio in Fort Myers, Florida, Anthony Iannucci. And I recorded our conversation so that you could learn from him as well. In fact, this video is actually part two of the entire interview, which was around two hours long, I think. And so you can check out part one as well. I have that linked in the description below. In this part two of our conversation, you are going to learn the best way you can go about learning audio engineering and music production, what making it in the industry really looks like, hint, it might not be what you think. Also, how to create and protect your ideal studio environment, how to get clients, how to know if you are ready to record at a pro studio in case you are considering going to a pro studio yourself to record or mix what it was like recording the members of ACDC and also some ACDC songwriting secrets are revealed in this interview as well. Anthony also shares the best equipment you should upgrade to next. So maybe if you have beginner equipment and you're wondering what's the best equipment you should upgrade to next, if you're ready for intermediate or advanced level equipment, Anthony breaks down the best equipment you should upgrade to. We also talk about the importance of unity gain and why it is vital to producing a pro high quality result. In fact, it's so important. That's why Anthony actually named his studio Unity Game. Before diving into the interview though, if you're looking for a proven step-by-step -step process for producing radio ready tracks from home, then just grab my free rapid song finishing checklist in the description below. All right, let's get to the interview. Being an educator, mm -hmm. what is kind of your approach to learning all this like from start to finish? Like what's someone's Maybe they're at home, maybe they're a beginner or an intermediate and they're just watching maybe videos on YouTube and mm -hmm. you get p pieces here and pieces there and you see a video and it's like just with this compressor, just turn this knob, this knob, and this knob and you right. get this sound. But it's in isolation to really understand the whole process. So what's your kind of approach to, to teaching? Yeah, um, I think that um, YouTube and the internet, like I'd mentioned before, is a tremendous asset and you can get mm -hmm. great information. But I do think you really need to look at statistics. You need to really get an abundance of what you're looking for so that you can surmise in the end, okay, since there's so many people that agree on this, mm -hmm. this is the proper way to Except approach it. Except for my channel, right? You can just trust oh, everything on my channel. There's, there's no question about that. You mm -hmm. don't have to look anywhere else. You yeah. know? But lots of times, because there's a lot of misinformation out there, you know? Mm -hmm. um, once you kind of surmise, hey, this is the way to approach it, I think the biggest frustration a lot of people have is how much is too much, how little is too little, you know? And those are the types of things that if you don't seek help from an educator, from a school, you're going to have to just do trial and error with. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to critically, It's not, there's nothing wrong with notating what you did. See, the great thing about digital today is that the, the moves I make on any of my processes are all remembered. I've got sheets from the analog days of where I had to copy down everything I did on the console. I actually made prints of the console where I just put dashes where the EQs go and <laughs> dashes where the faders sit. Um, and then you would hope to recall that and be as accurate with your interpretation of what you wrote. So I wrote three o'clock. It was more like two thirty, you mm. know, and that makes a difference, you mm -hmm. know? So you would, you know, be focused more now, not on that, but on the setting you thought would be best and then do an alternate setting and then compare them, you know? Uh, was my desire with this compressor to compress enough so that it was not detectable? Was I successful or was my desire with this compressor to compress and create the effect of compression? A lot of the synth pop stuff would be that compression expansion, mm -hmm. the purposeful misuse of compression or gating compression to make an effect. Right. So there's traditional ways and non-traditional ways to use these. Uh, my suggestion would be understand what they're designed for, then break the mold. You know? But to break the mold and not know what it's originally designed for may... You may be at a disadvantage, not really knowing what else it can do. So then really being intentional and sequential is really kind of the key. Absolutely. absolutely. Have a directive and then explore. Use different plugins. No, that's not going to work. There are lots of times that happens with me. I'm like, I'm looking for something and 
I think I have the go-to. And uh, I go through my list and I pull it out. No, it's not quite it, you know. And then you, you finally fall into, it's having in your mind's eye what you're looking for. Without that, I think anybody would be lost. Hmm. A lot of people are short-sighted to that. They think, oh, how do I get that sound? How do I get right. that studio sound? How do I, do you know what that sound sounds like? Could you stop, think about right now in your head what that sound is like? Well, try to emulate that. Mm -hmm. and keep looking for it. And if you can't find it, and you may be frustrated by it, then ask or research why you can't get it. And then whatever little bits more of information you can find, apply that and see if that's the answer. Because the trends are changing. Mm -hmm. what, what's sonically good? But, you know, there's this, there was this whole period of time where the loudness wars was right. a big thing. Who can get the loudest recording? I had a client say, if, your rec if the recording I did here can shut me down quicker than Aerosmith's pump, then I will have succeeded and you will have created the best recording for me. And I'm like, really? Mm -hmm. For me, dynamics, mm -hmm. uh, forget about level, but did I capture how expressive the instrument is? When it, it was a drummer, when the drummer plays a small you know, nuance of a snare flam to a big bang, was that dynamic captured right? Uh, when you have to make things loud, it's overuse of processors that become noticeable. Mm -hmm. And the focus not is the dynamics more than it is the volume, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that's over. But yeah, I shut him down a lot quicker than Aerosmith. And he came in and he was like, this is the greatest thing since the wheel. <laughs> I'm like, okay, as long as you're happy. Yeah. But there comes a point where you do have integrity with your recording too. You, right. you, there comes a point where you got to draw the line and say, hey, you hired me for what I do. Respect that to a degree, you know. Yeah, that's a good point. So talking about clients, how, do you know how many clients you, or how many artists Oof. you've recorded over the years? That's a great question. Um, I would not uh, be exaggerating if I said thousands at this point because uh, I was recording in New York uh, for a bunch of years from professionally from 82 to 86. And then here from 87 to now, um, you know, I've got a closet full of tape when we were using tape. Then I've got a closet full of CDs when we were backing up on CDs, which was, thank God, a much more space efficient way to do it. Then DVDs, because we know, although they're the same size, they hold more content. Um, and now drives, you know, so just even in drives since 2008, I've got them on drive number nine. Hmm. Uh, and they're like five terabyte drives. Wow. You know, so I'm um, drive number nine. And that's just, that's from 2009. So yeah, wow. it, it, it would be safe to say thousands. How many thousands? I, I, I wouldn't want to exaggerate. What are some enough. of the, the biggest kind of acts you've recorded? Uh, you know, a lot of people uh, think that if you record an act that's like real famous and known that you've made it or that they're the best to record. Mm -hmm. I've been fortunate. I have recorded some great, great people who everybody knows, like, you know, members of ACDC and uh, from the four, you know, the four tops to, I mean, a lot of different, a lot of different acts, voiceover work with a lot of people, band members from different groups from, you know, Manfred Mann and, and the list goes on and on. That doesn't become as important to me as working with somebody I really enjoy working with. And thank God those people I had mentioned were great people and were memorable experiences. And there are amateurs that come in and record that are not very, very pleasurable to record. <laughs> and then there are pros that come in that are not very pleasurable to record. So, you know, um, I once had a student say, wow, you know, here you are in Florida. And if you were in New York, you could have made it. Mm. You know, so what's your definition of making it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's what you got to ask yourself. Yeah, it's prestigious to say I've worked with this one, I've worked with that one. I've you know worked with tracks. You know, I've exchanged tracks with Rick Rick Rubin. Worked with Trick Daddy. You know, stuff like that. Worked with this person as they were nurtured to become. You know, who they are. You know, I recorded Debbie Gibson's first project. I mean, it, it, as I think, the list goes on and on mm -hmm. and on. But the memories, a lot of my fondest memories lie with local people and even international people who I've worked with that are not as known, you mm -hmm. know, because just the reward of working with people and collaborating and then having a product that comes out great, you know, in your, in your estimation is really the reward, you know? So yeah, I've, I've worked with a lot of great people 
who are average everyday people and great people who are well well known people. You know, that's a great point. You know, yeah. it's 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 so true though. We're all people. The more you get to know the real well known people, you know. I was invited to go to Vegas to go see ACDC, and you know, I got these priority seats, and I turn around and I'm looking at this place packed. And they're all here to see my friends. They're my friends. And they're all here to see my friends. And I'm like, and then when I went to the back, you know, in the back room after the show to see them, you know, there's little big hugs and embraces. And, and then the lead singer says, what are, you, what are you doing here? I was just in the studio two weeks ago, you know? <laughs> I'm like, I came to see the show. He goes, why did you fly away to see the show? You know, he's kind of right. I know them, but it's exciting to get that perspective mm -hmm. of it. You know what I mean? Right. It's like, uh, but you realize, they are regular people. They're just regular people. So sometimes it's cool to keep that fantasy and that mm -hmm. shatter it. Other times it brings you down to earth to realize, hey, they're like you and I. Mm -hmm. They really are. You know, it's that was a good aspect to learn, you know, how others perceive them and you realize I, I to this day I still have these icons I'd love to meet and, you know, because they're untouchable. Once you touch them, your perspective your perspective changes completely, mm -hmm. you know. For the good, for some, for the worse, for others, you know. Right. Fantasy is a powerful thing. <laughs> it really is. So speaking of, so working with all those artists, mm -hmm. working with people, mm -hmm. there's a lot of, can be a lot of conflict or things that come up. Mm -hmm. So how do you, what are some things you've learned about to make things run smoothly in the studio? Yeah, no, that's a good point. I, I think that what my objective always has been, and even designing the studio has always been, this is a feel good place. This is a place that people come to feel good, that they feel comfortable creating in. You know, you'll notice the lighting is very moody. It's not cafeteria light. There's no fluorescent lights. You know, uh, that, one, um, that one studio I mentioned where my my wife recorded with her sister is there that fluorescent light right over where they were recording, and you just hear all these oh buzzes, and yeah, hums, of course, yeah, yeah major problems with that because of uh, electroharmonic distortions. Yeah, you know, we have technical issues we got to deal with, but more than that, the aesthetics. Mm -hmm. um, I can't tell you how many people have come in to just see the studio and said, "This has got a good feel." That's important to me because any place you create in has got to be conducive to creation. Um, and again, I, I think you and I were speaking on the side about uh, recently there was a release of um, a Beatles film called, you know, Get Back. And that's a perfect example. They were thrust into a situation in a very big motion picture recording room that was a cold warehouse and then told create. Mm. And even talent of that magnitude weren't able to be at their best because the surroundings didn't make them feel real good, mm -hmm. you know? And then how that whole thing changed when they went to an area that made them feel good. That was a great movie to see that actually happen in real time. You know, it was mm -hmm. amazing within weeks or days, you know? Um, yeah, that's really interesting because you think about often aesthetics is kind of not really that important or it's just kind of Oh, it's good to look at or whatever, but it's not, there's not any real consequences in our, oh, yeah. our real world, right? Yeah. But it actually does. It plays a very important part. May, and don't get me wrong. I, I learned how to build a recording studio only through learning how to build a bad one. <laughs> <laughs> I was commissioned to help build a studio that came out horrible. The person who built it was a carpenter, so aesthetically, it looked phenomenal. And it felt great to record in, but it didn't work technically. Mm. So there is that balance. Right. A lot of the technical stuff is behind the wallboard, is behind mm -hmm. the paint job, is behind right. the ceiling. And you've got wires floors. running what, under the floor oh, here. Oh, there's trusses and the yeah. behind the walls. Just the, the walls themselves, you know, are lined with, you know, rebar that's tied in with copper for a Faraday shield mm -hmm. just to protect RF, especially nowadays. You know, I wasn't thinking in 99 when I developed this room that like, okay, cell phones are going to be in tremendous abundance, you know, mm -hmm. because that's frequency you right. know and um thank god because you know when you walk into this room you're going to see a, a drop in your cell phone signal big time mm -hmm. because i'm trying to keep out of those interferences that would disturb the recording so there are technical considerations but really a very important aspect as important would be the aesthetics like we were talking about okay yeah so the faraday shield there's a lot of stories and movies about mm -hmm. emps leading to the end of the world but You'll still be fine. Be able to record. You'll music. be fine here. You may hear a couple of voices here and there, you know. But you know, no, it's um, it's it's that interference. You know, our arch enemy is um outside frequency, mm -hmm. and um, that's yeah. The I reason mean, when I'm recording at home, 
Mm. I'll be recording. I'm like, what's that buzzing sound? I'm like, oh, my cell phone's too close to the, my interface. So yeah, it's, it's called yeah. GSM interference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, even though it's at a different frequency range, there are byproducts in capturing that signal that spill in harmonic distortions that spill into the range of audio. It's the reason why sampling is um, is so high. Sampling is done at a much higher frequency than what we hear because of those spill down problems, because of those harmonic distortions that exist for the process to happen. So yeah, protection, protecting your environment, not only acoustically, you know, from a truck passing by, but things you can't see, interference, electroharmonic mm -hmm. interference, stuff like that, very, very important. So definitely, and also, yeah, have a backup battery is really important too, especially. Yeah, well, that. being in the lightning capital of the world, mm -hmm. don't forget you've got equipment that is existing in what I call in, in Edisonian age, meaning Thomas Edison pretty much was the father of electric, um, you know, next to Tesla. Um, those those aspects of development, you know, were, were archaic because it's a different world in the early 1900s than it is now. Integrated circuit wasn't even born. Now to have um, a system that, you know, if you vary by a fraction of a volt can determine its behavior and its life. It's the reason why you buy this TV set, you you honor it, you you clean it, you unplug it. But what happens is, you know, all of a sudden it dies on you. Well, because a certain amount of those jolts, of those voltage jolts, are going to wind up shortening the life of that mm -hmm. piece of equipment. If you really condition your power feeding your equipment and you treat it right, you know, I spoke to the developer of my console and I said, sir, when you designed a console, did, did you design it to turn off at what frequency? He says, I designed it to never turn off. Hmm. And then I said, well, I live in the lightning capital of the world. He says, well, I would wait about eight hours to turn it off then. Hmm. So what kills a piece of equipment is turn on, turn off, is the okay. surge in, surge out. That's the killer. Once it's up and running. So that's the same with like your computer. If you're having a desktop computer, your Absolutely. laptop, you should try and keep those on. Putting it to sleep is important. Okay. And then if you're, um, and also low voltage um, uh, interfer uh, interference and destruction, um, your internet line or your ethernet cord can create a lot more damage than can your AC cord. Okay. Hmm. Very important. Low voltage, electrostatic interference. So if you're not using circuits. that, just leave it unplugged. Unplug it. Okay. Yeah, unplug Ethernet connections for sure. That's that's very, very important for hmm. me. Okay. I've had that's too much know. experience. I didn't know that. Okay. Too much experience uh, with, with burnout equipment, with hmm. equipment. Thousand dollar modules, I come in the next day lighting up like a Christmas tree. Hmm. And then sending it out to, you know, my cousin who's does hardware repairs for the state of California and him saying, I don't know what happened to this thing. All I know is every component in the unit's burnt. Hmm. He goes, use it as an anchor the next, the, next, the next time you fish. And that happened to me a couple of times until hmm. I learned my, my lesson. I even use conditioners to try to condition out. Those spikes are so quick and powerful. Just unplug it. Hmm. Just unplug okay. it. So the second I'm done with that piece, I run to it and unplug it because it's a $1,000 you know, investment. Hmm. Telephone based. Yeah, yeah. So then getting back to, to clients, I know today you probably get a lot of clients just through like word of mouth, but how did you get started or how could someone, the home studio or maybe right. just through the internet go about getting clients? I think, um, I think with any business that's successful, a good business is one that relies on uh, word of mouth, you know? Uh, we're in an industry, well, you know, the world's a small place and I know it's a very, very common, common term, but you'd be surprised how many people know about you in the community if you do the right thing, if you do the right, the right amount of, you know, uh, of good things for people and create good recordings, which is why before I was saying it's important to keep your credibility up. Um, I would say um, go to places that the music community exists in, you know, so you're not, you're, you're less apt to find clients at, you know, Publix than you would if you went to Brent's Music or Guitar Center or a place mm -hmm. where there's music, you know, so, or clubs, right? So I think that that would be the place, years ago it used to be, um, we used to call them rags or flyers, we would send flyers around, because again, not having internet, where would you get these people? Well, if they're walking to buy food at Publix, or if they're walking to buy shoes, or if they're, so you put them everywhere, that's mm -hmm. what they call flyers, they fly around, you know? But now with internet, I think a social presence is important. I think um, uh, really being up on, you know, on what's happening, um, you know, with communities and blogs and groups and, and even, uh, you know, uh, situations like what you're, what you're doing, you're, you're inadvertently pulling communities together of mm -hmm. people. 
And that's important. I think it's important for the perpetuation. It really is. Good. Get some, yeah. That, yeah. There's definitely a lot of places online like, um, like Upwork or Sound Better, things like that, where you can actually, you know, post jobs and get jobs. Yes. <laughs> Godzilla yeah, yeah, intruding. God. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I was watching a Godzilla movie one time. You know, that's my medicine when I'm sick, and I rarely get sick, but I was watching it. I said, that would be a great ringtone. Mm-hmm. So I recorded it. <laughs> Bingo. That's been there a long time. Mm-hmm. I've been there by 15 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, was, yeah. I remember that from when I first was Yeah, it's been there, there a while. Yeah. We talked a lot about right, how to get professional sounding recordings from home, from home. What are the you know best taxis sh- you can use to, to get that? But what are other are advantages to just coming in? I mean, obviously there's advantages to just coming into a professional studio like right. this. So like, how does an artist know when they're ready? And what are some um, things they should be aware of when they're coming into recording uh, at a professional studio? And what are the advantages they, they, they get there that you just can't get at home? Yeah, I think that, uh, that that's an excellent point because... Um, First of all, the recording process is not just there's not just a fix or not just a, a, a more important aspect of the signal chain than another. So it, it is the room you choose, it is the microphone choice you make, how you place that microphone, how the signals carry through your equipment. Finally, how you treat it through your conversion process to the recorder. Uh, any one of those are compromised, much like a chain. The weakest link is where you're gonna have a problem with it. How does an artist know that? they would be ready for such a thing. I think that the mistake artists would you know, potentially make is coming in, um, looking to do something, um, let's say an original song, without experiencing headphones, without experiencing mm-hmm. how it sounds, you know, uh, through your headphones, you know, speaking and singing. It's very different. Mm-hmm. Even seasoned uh, musicians who play out live and then come into the studio have to adjust up. Um, I find when you know, especially with bands who experience lots of loud sounds, when they're in the re- when they're in rehearsal in these warehouses that are not acoustically treated correctly, it's hard for them to hear the real definition of what they're hearing. So when they come into the studio, they're surprised to hear what they hear, <laughs> and it's this adjustment of the drummer. And this specific drummer I'm thinking about told me it's years and years I'm sitting next to this huge stack of speakers, and now I'm putting a two inch speaker on his head. And he wants to get that same feel of the kick drum. It's near impossible, you know. It's relative to what else the other blends you give in your in your headphone feed. So yeah, it's experiencing. I think that you can go into the studio, and I can pretty much say this for any facility, uh, you know, for their lowest rate to do something that would be, uh, you know, minimal. For instance, karaoke. People call it karaoke. A pre-recorded track. You could be an instrumentalist, a saxophone player. Get something to play f- with. And then experience that, the interaction with the engineer and how, how the room sounds and how your recording sounds when you come in. Not only is it going to help you in that respect, but it's going to also help um, shape what you think or how you think it should sound. So then you can communicate with the engineer if you're the artist and say, hey, um, I want my saxophone to sound more like, you know, or uh, less like. Know, so it depends. There's two different perspectives, the artist's perspective or the engineer's perspective. Mm-hmm. And I believe your question was from the artist's perspective coming into a right. record. Yeah, I would say the more experience you have prior to doing an original song, <clears throat> excuse me, the better, such is the case with a lot of them that come in. I, I kind of have a mandatory pre-production meeting with them to say, okay, you know, have you done this before? And, and, uh, and most of them will say yes, but not in, in a facility like this. And I'll be like, okay, do you know what to expect with headphones? That kind of helps uh, crack that ice too by having the okay. pre-production meeting. They get to meet you. They get to see the facility. So that's probably a really great idea for, on the other end, if you're a producer, you're looking to get a client, make sure you Absolutely. get, you have that meeting to get clear on what their vision is. Cause sure. right. You can want to put in all that work and then it's like, oh, I wanted something completely different. So. Sure, what are, what are, yeah, so how does that go? What are other questions you ask? Well, you know, a lot of people say, well, what does it take to be a producer? You know, what it takes to be a producer is somebody who knows engineering and understands that genre of music and wants to assemble sounds in such a way to be competitive in that genre, you know? So, you know, it, when a band would come in or when an artist would come in, I would kind of try to get into their head as to what their vision is. You know, everybody's got a vision in their mind of what an ideal sound is. It chances are it's not like what your vision is of it mm-hmm. because we're all different in our upbringing and what we're exposed to. So 
lots of times I'll ask, so um, who do you listen to a lot? I notice that a lot of people don't like to be compared to anybody. Uh -huh. I was going to ask, like, yeah. do you get people telling you that their music's just too unique? Nothing like anything. Yeah, like, yeah. And I'm like, so I start out with saying, not that I'm comparing your music to any other mm -hmm. music, but if you would revere a certain singer in the industry, and it could be of any genre, from opera to pop to rock to rap to... Whose voice do you think, if this is the singer I'm speaking to, whose voice do you think sounds the best out there? Mm. That's a tricky way of getting into right. their head, of finding out texture-wise what they're looking for. Because likely for. they've probably been influenced by them, even if Definitely. they don't realize it. Absolutely. Same with guitarists, same with drummers. So then you take those, which very much, most times are different perspectives. This one likes the vocals from that type of music. This one likes the drums from that type of music. This one likes the guitar from that type of music. You put those elements together, and I think that's what creates uniqueness. You, you're really capitalizing on what they are as individuals, but you've got to have some idea as to what they're thinking. Tricky. Mm -hmm. I've had clients come in and say, this is what I'm thinking. <clears throat> Listen to my idea that I put down on tape, and I'm listening to it and saying, okay, from my interpretation from what they're saying, their age, your age has a lot to do, too, with what, you, what you've been mm -hmm. exposed to. Yep. I think this is going to be the type of direction to take as a production team. And then um, you ask a question and then they say, no, um, I'm thinking more along the lines of, and then they pull up, say, pull up this song. It's complete. It's 180 degrees out mm -hmm. of your thinking. And yes, you know, so sometimes it's not, you can't 100% or even a fraction of a percentage read them a hundred. You know, you got to really kind of keep prying and asking and prying and make sure you're targeting what you really need to target. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's really, yeah, definitely. Cause yeah, I ran into that issue with some of my clients I was working with was they would tell me it was one, one thing. thing and then it ended up being something else. So yeah, it's Not probably common. Got to keep asking those questions and dig deeper. Yes. Well, what are some of the most memorable sessions you've had recording sessions or mixing <laughs> sessions? <laughs> well, um, I've had a lot of them, um, very bizarre ones. I've had, um, great one. I mean, lots of fun ones. Um, I've never, I was just say never. Only a handful of times have I had experiences that uh, I, I don't relish and that I would not like to have again, you know. Um, but um, are you thinking more along the lines of what? Bizarre? Yeah, I, I guess like, just what, yeah, bizarre that stood out or that were really great experiences or, yeah, or, yeah, just something wild. Well, um, just a, just a, just a kind of smattering of things. Um, I've had, um, Positive experience. I always think of positive experiences, and it certainly 99.9% .9 of the clients that came in, I've had a positive experience with. Um, you know, I, like I mentioned before, some of the people that you and I know in the industry, you know, that they come in and they're so well known, but at the same time, they treat you as an equal, and they and they're so so like the members of ACDC was a great experience because they really are people, people, people who really. Uh, are mindful of you as you mm. record. And, um, and that goes a long, long way because it gets the best of you, you know. I've had um, some very famous people, and it makes no sense to mention them because in a, on a negative you know, connotation, that didn't make you feel very comfortable mm. uh, when you were in there. And, you know, as you look back in retrospect, it's because of their own personal problems uh, that later you discover they had, you know. So you like to kind of relish on... Mm -hmm. the positive experiences then you've just got bizarre experiences um i once had a, a person come in who was a preacher and uh they wanted to record and of course they said sure and they put a deposit down for some time and came the following week and uh had a different appearance about them and everything but were carrying something with them and i would say what are you carrying and they're like well this is this is my accompanist and uh, I've learned in, when I told them to open the box that it was a blender, a, <laughs> a common food blender, and um, asked them how he determined that to be his accompanist. And he said, well, it's, you know, I, I, I do a lecture. He's, he was a person, you know, he's a preacher. I do a lecture to this blender. And I said, hey, it's all art the way you look at it. <laughs> so I put this blender in a booth and mic'd it. And then I <laughs> How put do you mic the, a blender? Oh, it's it's. Let me tell you, I learned a lot about micing a blender. You have to put it approximately three inches from the mud. No. Yeah, use bum line? I don't, th I don't think it mattered at this <laughs> point because it was the most bizarre thing I did. Uh, and then I mic'd, of course, the vocal as I normally would. And then 
again, puts a whole new meaning to mix. It's not a joke. I really did mix them. Uh, and the client was happy, you know, but it, bizarre. That was probably the strangest thing I ever did for sure was uh, mix a blender with a, a vocal. Nice. But I've, you know, people have nervous tics. People like the lights down, like the lights up, like to sit down, like to stand up, like to stand in weird positions, you know. <laughs> and that that goes back real, real far, um, way, way to very famous people that have tried innovative ways to record and stuff like that. Mm. And uh, it's just, um, if it's not dangerous, it doesn't hurt anybody, I would certainly entertain it. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? But if you know it's going to be counterproductive and not real, you know, useful to them, it's kind of, it becomes a waste of time. Okay. You know? So what was it like recording with ACDC then? Was there anything that they did that was unique? Um... You know, what people don't realize about recording with people who are well-known is that they're experienced. So it's rewarding to you to work with a caliber of person who's been experienced in the studio, but does realize every studio has got a unique sound no one has. So for instance, be it worse or better, their experience here sounded different than it did wherever else they record. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and... I'm, I was honored to work with them in that respect because they are, they're well respected and, you know, they're pros at what they do. But it was nice because um, I can focus more on what I do uh, because rest assured, I knew that what they did was already wrapped up. They knew what they were doing, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, a lot of the, the, the song creation was done right here in this room. Um, one of the surprising things in those sessions that I actually almost forgot to mention was that um, when I heard I was going to be recording with Brian, who was the lead singer of East DC, um, Cliff, who's the bass, the bass player, organized this little group to kind of get together to have fun. We just got together to have fun. Nine songs. And um, when I knew Brian was coming, of course, I wanted to do the best I could, so I acquired a microphone, a high-energy mic. You know, Brian Johnson's a screamer. He sings very loud. So I figured, let me get microphone that's going to be appropriate because certain microphones if you understand mics are not appropriate because of the potential for the preamplifier that's built into the mic to distort and create mm -hmm. an undesirable sound so i got a high energy microphone and um do you know what microphone that was yeah i used the uh the shore sm7b oh, wow. which is a, a very popular mic for screamers rappers um michael jackson used it in thriller you know in my opinion one of the best shore microphones out there for sure mm -hmm. but it takes a lot to drive the mic, so you got to have equipment, a, a cloud lifter, or a good preamp to really push it, you know, or a very powerful singer, and for sure Brian was. But I, I set the mic up in a booth, and when he came in and I first met him and trying to establish a nice, comfortable environment, he said, I'm not recording in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He goes, prima donna. I'm going to, no, he didn't <laughs> say it like that. He said it more like, um, I want to record where everybody else is. And I understood him because the most important thing when you have a detached environment where let's say, for instance, you, the engineer and the producer here and the artist is in the vocal booth is to always have that communication mic set up. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have that button pressed and they don't hear what you're talking about, it's very frustrating for them. It changes their attitude. It changes their performance ability to include them, be it a discussion about playback, you know, 99% of the time, it's a proactive discussion that's not talking anything bad about the performance, but it's talking about how we can improve it, how we can maybe change it to do a different approach on stacking it. Let's say they perceive it as what could it be? Why are they, why did they stop? Why are they not including me? You know? Mm. So I understood him when he said that because he probably experienced that where you have big producers like Mutt, Mutt Lang who produced Back in Black, you know, um, talking to the rest of the band about this is what I'm looking for with the vocal, maybe not including him. Mm. I don't know that to be the case, but maybe not. And so he wanted to sing in here. So I said, well, there's a fundamental problem with that because as you guys experience, even in your, at your homes, you can't sing in the same room you're monitoring in. That is unless you've got a professional tool that has great rejection mm -hmm. as well as acceptance. So yeah, right on the corner of that table, of the table to the left of me, he sang every song hmm. and he was loud, <laughs> very, very loud. It was, it was Brian Johnson versus Unity Gain speakers. Wow. <laughs> and 
boy, he's like, bring it up. And I'm like, wow. And it was amazing. It didn't really feed feedback. And any other artist, I would have said, no, you're out of your mind. There's no, but I respected him to the point at which he knew what he was talking about. And sure enough, it worked. It did work. So I learned it can work. It's just, you have to allow for bleed. You've got to have a good tool. You can't put a 57, 58, a cheap mic there and expect that same result without feedback. Mm -hmm. Because your speakers and your microphone, once they meet, they create a feedback loop and usually to the point at which something breaks. Right. Yeah. You know? So that was an interesting lesson I learned, an interesting approach to production. Um, and I understood him after that because we really did, it really was productive that way. Uh, they were writing right on that table, the majority mm. of the songs, you know, and we all had, we all had a, a part in it, you know? Yeah. So is there any, anything unique that they had or any, um, thing different about how they went about writing? They the had songs? the, um, well, they had the luxury of writing on studio time. You know, I always encourage everybody to prepare as much as they can at home. But even at that, when you prepare stuff at home and I notice a lot of them come in with this stuff printed out from musically for the arrangers and there's still a modification that occurs in the studio because when you collaborate, those unique ideas are going to always create and spur new ideas that maybe the artists didn't think about when they first were writing it. Um, yeah, it, um, it was really interesting because they, their ears, they weren't closed, closed minded. We've done this before. We got this. They were up for any suggestions. Mm. You know, I would suggest something. And I only saw that as an opportunity because they asked for suggestions, you know. Um, you know, as an engineer, you're not a producer unless you're asked your opinion. <laughs> mm -hmm. At that point, you pretty much should let, if it's self-produced or somebody else produced, you should let that breathe. If you see a train wreck, technically, I think it's your job to, to imagine something. Mm -hmm. But with them, they knew what was happening every step of the way. It was a matter of this is the way they felt the unity of the collaboration. You know, if you, if you ask an artist, how'd you write this song? There's so many diverse ways songs are written. First, they may have a melody, or they'll have words, mm -hmm. or they'll have a groove they wrote words and a melody to. And I mean, I've, I've been really asking people that question for years, and it's incredible how diverse um, so what was, AC, what was ACDC's approach? Did they start with the music first or lyrics or melody? Um, what they did was um, they had a groove. They had a, a music groove. <clears throat> and then they had a concept on what they wanted to say within that groove. And then they wrote around it. You know, so, um, you know, a song we did was called Chain Gang, you know, Chain, Chain Gang on the, on the Road. And it was like, well, how do you end up on a chain gang? You know, well, you know, you get caught doing something. So the FBI is mentioned, the CIA, you know. So that's what's kind of is the birth of the words, mm -hmm. is the birth of the first concept, and then the cadence the words have to sit in within a certain frame. And it's amazing to, um, to see that born because that's not easy to do. Right. <laughs> that's not easy because you've got a certain group that's inspiring you for an idea and then you take a global idea and then you get people shooting ideas mm -hmm. and then somebody making a final decision. Usually it's the singer because the singer's got to sing it. <laughs> right. You know, so is it phonetically, is, it, is, the, is the, you know, Slavic count correct? Do I need to modify the words? They may say a word and he doesn't like it because it doesn't say it as clearly as he wants to say it, you know? It, it's fun. It, that's fun in seeing that born because... Without every element in place in that situation, I don't really see that ever turning out like that. Mm. Unless everybody's in that unique situation, everybody's idea contributed. Right. So that's kind of, I guess, you're, you hear a lot of the downsides to being in a band, but that's kind of one of the positives is you get all oh, these different ideas. It's working together. Um, to me, collaboration is key. Um, it, it isn't qual quality of musicianship. I want to say that right. It's not, oh, he's the best guitarist. He's the best bassist. He's the best drummer. He's the best lyricist. He's the best singer. But it's the chemistry mm -hmm. of those people. Um, and there's so many examples of that through history. Um, collaboration is really, really important. And you can see when that collaborative um, chemistry changes how the complexity changes. Look at the chemistry between Elton John and Bernie at Taupin in the 70s, you know, which is an incredible combination of writer-player, you know, when you ask Bernie at Taupin or Elton John, how did, how'd you do it? How'd you guys work together? It would, 
Bernie Taupin would write something, give it to Elton, and Elton said, I would think of myself being in a movie. Hmm. And I would close my eyes and think of this, this whole dramatic scene based upon these words in this movie, and hmm. he'd write his melody like that. Wow. Very, very unique. You know, so it's, it's fascinating to hear how that would happen. Um, and you can't help but to be influenced from your past. He was a piano player, you know, he got lessons in piano and, and then influenced by, you know, his, his past positives and negatives, which, which made him who he is. It's, it's what makes everybody who they are today, you know? Yeah, definitely. So yeah, that's really, yeah. yeah. So collaboration, definitely. Yeah, it's important. I, I definitely suggest you, you look at, um, and there's a lot of free streams out there, like even Tubi that. They have this endless list of great videos on the birth of music, you know, like, like I, I never knew myself, Washington, you know, DC was the birthplace for a lot of grooves in rap and R&B and <laughs> big, big place. LA, you, even though I was in the scene in New York, in LA, big punk movement, you know what I mean, a certain genre. Um, it's, it's, it's fascinating, it's just in the States, uh, if you understand the history of music, it, you can really get a lot of ideas as to how things turned out the way they did, you know? It's okay. quite fascinating. Yeah. Interesting. So uh, when it comes to equipment, so right, obviously you have all the, the budget equipment that maybe a beginner would have um, when they're looking to actually invest in like their first like quality piece of equipment, like when it comes to maybe an interface, a microphone, or like monitors, what would you recommend? You know, um, in this digital world, I think a lot of what's overseen or what's overlooked is the interface. And um, I'm of the opinion, um, we now have Macintoshes, which, you know, PCs can be used as well. And it, it's simple. I get nothing for endorsing Mac. It's just that it's got a longer track record. It's got much more R&D behind the relationship behind, you know, software, hardware. The Macintosh conversion process, right with built into every single one, is lots of times equal, if not better, than some of the cheaper interfaces. Hmm. And some of the cheaper interfaces don't really offer much more flexibility. I would say invest once and invest right. You know, so spend a little, save a little bit, and spend a little bit more on you know a Motu module or a, uh, an Apogee module or, you know, a Quattro, you know, go with Apollo. Um, they tried and, and they're proven and they can be added upon. You don't have to eliminate that investment. You can right. just add to it and use it as well. You so know? you'd say an interface is probably the first thing you should invest in before well, a microphone? Or? again, there's so many different pieces to the puzzle here. Mm -hmm. I guess I started out with interface thinking it's, it's one of the most important things that a lot of people don't realize is important. You see the microphone is important because it's always in the scene. Right. You see the software and its operation is important because it's always, the interface is the stagnant thing that sits in the back, in the background. That's a very important piece. Like I mentioned before, acoustic treatment of your room, balancing of your listening environment, a good microphone. Um, you know, for me, <laughs> you have to kind of like make yourself out of budget and say, well, how much can I allocate for that? And then if it's a microphone, what is it I'm going to be doing with it? If you need diversity in the mic, it's worth saving money and buying a mic that's going to work in many applications from guitar to drum to vocal to... So what know, kind of mic might that be? Uh, I would say a Sennheiser 4 or 21 probably would be uh, my go-to. I've got five of them. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? That's how much I respect them. Um, the SM7B is a great mic. The one we were mentioning that I had purchased for Brian Butt um, it does need some special considerations because of its low output. Something like the 421's got selectable patterns in the back. It's a moving coil mic. It can take a, a slam. It's great in many different scenarios. So you want a chameleon, you know. Um, what about a vocal mic? Vocals, you know, um, for me, um, again, that would work if that was your first mic and you were on a budget. Um, I, I would definitely look toward a condenser microphone. And um, I would... Buy in some of the brands that you know um, uh, are well respected in the industry. AKG, Neumann, you know, these are great mics. Um, and they've been great mics for years for a reason because they have a reputation. But it's unfair to say that without saying there's a lot of new mi microphone manufacturers on the block that um, could be just as good and, uh, and, and uh, you know, sound sonically 
if not good, better than some of the low level AKGs, let's say, you know. <laughs> Case in point would be one of the engineers I work with here who is a microphone developer. He actually makes his own mics. Mm -hmm. he, he, he reverse engineers others. And he's made me two microphones that I am very impressed with, you know. But I'd never know unless I knew the other ones and could do comparative analysis properly. Mm -hmm. The person who has not experienced that would just have to take my word for it or somebody else who's experienced it. Their, their word for it, hey, this one at a fraction of the price. I mean, mm -hmm. literally built me for $300 a microphone. Yeah, I need to get in, in touch with Alan you're talking about. Yes, um, excellent. There might be people in my audience that want some custom mics built. So. Ab absolutely. He's a, a monster. He's here in Fort Myers. He's just an incredible, you know, driving force and really wanting to know. And a lot of these are- Yeah, he are, builds his own guitar pedals and everything. He's, in, he's incredible. A lot of these are kind of like guarded secrets rightfully so because you don't want you have an industry you've put a lot of r&d and research and pros on developing these things and you don't want them to just be flagrantly released you know but it takes a lot of research to know what type of capsules they use mm -hmm. what type of components because yes right down to the tube those are crucial elements within a microphone to make it what it is the character it is mm -hmm. and but he's got that down i highly recommend if you're thinking high end to go custom if you know that source is good as alan is great, mm -hmm. great source awesome but what, what about like monitors especially if you're in like a home in a bedroom mm -hmm. you probably need like a smaller monitor. So you you had mentioned yeah. you would prefer if you had to choose one maybe a smaller well there's two size, different so. um monitor approaches one would be active which means it's one that's got an amplifier built into the monitor itself and then there's passive which means it needs an external amplifier to drive the output um, I've always been a fan of passive speakers because, um, they're a little more true, but with that said, there's some active monitors out there now that are just kicking their great. JBL puts a great line out. Adams puts a great line out clips. I mean, there's a whole bunch of them out there. I'm kind of, I'm old school guy. That's, that's like, if it isn't broken, don't fix it type guy, you know? Now the NS 10 M's, which are the Yamahas I use near fields, they're passive and the actual wood that makes the box, which has a major factor on the overall quality, is no longer it's outlawed to use. It's a wow. birch from Brazil or something. I won't tell anyone. And you have some to. of the new ones that have come out, and I don't have any experience in saying, oh, it doesn't sound like that speaker. I'd love to hear one, but I've not listened to the new ones. But it's my understanding almost 10 years ago since they're using a new wood which has changed the quality of the of the monitor but I, again this is not these are not the only monitors in the world that that you can use um i think monitoring is getting better and better and better i think or i know for sure a big problem is um mis miscalculating the speaker for its size and what it can do <laughs> there's some very very small speakers like some bose and polk ones that can generate bass that's unbelievable that you're like you're looking behind you like where where's the subwoofer you know so there's some technologies out there with you know with bass reflex and porting that can create some great great you know dynamics with that said you know dr dre's beats and stuff like that you got to watch it because like we originally were talking about before, you don't want to create a situation in your room that's over amplifying mm -hmm. or over exaggerating bass or treble. You want something flat and linear, linear meaning not bumpy in any area. Right, not the frequency accentuating. is flat. The curve yeah. is flat. Yeah. So there's so many choices out there. It would be unfair. Uh, I would say, um, you know, stick with a linear choice. And if you're going to choose, uh, you know, a, uh, a pair regardless of what it is again analyzing your room is important and i think now it's more affordable than ever that there's mm -hmm. almost no excuse to not do it if you're serious about it mm -hmm. you know poor man's approach would be okay i'm gonna wing it i'm gonna save the hundred bucks and i'm gonna take a couple of months and analyze what i've done and see if i like it outside and mm -hmm. tweak that way just a little adjust adjustments here and there mm -hmm. yeah for sure so why'd you name your studio Unity Gain? What's the Unity sort of Gain, so? interesting. Well, a quick interesting story. Um, I always had this this desire to be a uh, an audio engineer ever since I was little. I had recorders and so on and so forth. So, you know, I got a pretty big more family. so than a dentist. More so than a dentist okay, for sure. Yeah. And no one pushed me to be a dentist. It was just for some reason 
that was also for some reason attractive, which now I can't figure out why. <laughs> but anyway, so being my little recording enthusiast, I'm talking at the age of 10, 12, um, I have a pretty big family in New York. One of my cousins, older than me, had a uh, relationship with a very big tape manufacturing facility in the New York area called Burlington. So he said, you like to use these cassette decks a lot. I'm going to set you up with my friend who is a distributor of tape. I go, great. So here I am, 15 now or 14. He drives me there and I make my little account and I'm buying cassettes from him and I'm recording with my cassette deck, which was, of course was the hottest thing. And, and at that time, we're talking 1970s, five, six, hmm. seven, you know. So there's a reason why I'm telling the story. So basically I... um. I do that, I do that, I'm with it. I decide in 1987 uh, to come to Florida. I come to Florida, relocate, get everything going. Uh, I'm in motion late 87, early 88, and I call up Burlington and I say, this is Anthony. Uh, oh yeah, you're, you're Dave's friends from Carmine and so on and so forth. Yeah, um, I need to change my account from my name to a new name that I created as a corporate name. He goes, shoot, shoot, no problem. He goes, okay, Anthony, your last name? I go, uh, I knew G. He goes, I don't find it. I'm, I'm not finding it here. I go, this is impossible. I know you. And this is the owner of the facility. <laughs> what? It winds up that at the age of 15, I put Unity Gain <laughs> as my name. Wow. So that was really kind of spooky and weird. I went, he goes, what are you going to name the facility? I said, Unity Gain. He goes, here it is right here. I go, what are you talking about? He goes, you, you actually gave me the name Unity Game when you were 15, that many years ago. Wow. Go, wow. So what does it mean? It means carrying the signal through each and every stage of the process optimally. You know, at Unity, you're, you're not adding nor subtracting signal uh, that should be there at a regular flow rate or energy. Right. So if you throw an EQ on your, on your track, say an insert effect, mm -hmm. and you're making boosts, you're increasing volume. So now you need to bring the output down to compensate. And that's for every step of the process. Again, you're good. You, yeah. you know some stuff. <laughs> a good teacher. Okay. <laughs> you know some stuff. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And if you maintain it, because think about it, um, that's just a single signal we're talking about. Let's say the average mix is 2430. I've done mixes with 100 tracks. 100 times that approach is going to give you a great recording. Mm -hmm. 100 times that neglect what if happens if you don't maintain unity gain? Well, a perfect example would be, as I'm learning in New York from my mentor, who I told you about earlier, he said to me, okay, I've got this recording. We're going to use the same console, the same exact tape machine, and play back the same song. I would like you to mix this song to the best of your ability. So I took the song, and not having to pay for studio time because I was engineering there, I took my time and mixed this thing. I mean, I'm going to prove to him I got the greatest ears in the world. And, you know, um, as you mature as a mixing engineer, yeah, there are times as you're doing it, you're like, wow, this is, this is good. And it is probably better than your previous one. But then years later, you listen back to it and say, what was I thinking back then? You know, mm -hmm. you develop and get oh, yeah. better and better and better. So basically, I, I, I'm proud to present this mix. And then he played it. He listened to it. He said, very good. Listen, that, blah. Then he played me his mix. Mm. Boy, was that an eye opener. I went, and he didn't play it to embarrass me, to put me down, to make me sound like I don't know what I'm doing, but he played it to prove a point. Mm -hmm. And he pushed across the point of unity gain too. Mm. He said, this is what you can squeeze out of a system if you really understand the circuitry, what the system can do, what the playback engine can do, what your, your preamp systems can do. Mm -hmm. And it was, I wish I had it today. It was night and day. Mm. It was just... It made mine sound so ridiculous, you know, but in my world, mine was great. But in the real world, mm -hmm. if you were to pick between them, there was no comparison. The image, the, you know, as a developing engineer, <clears throat> you have little ticks you have problems with. And as I look back, I don't know why, panning. Where's mm -hmm. the right place to place them? How much, how far, you know, uh, compression, how much do I use overall level? How much level is too much, too little? All those factors add up in the end to, you know, what's going to sound right. Mm -hmm. So, so, it so it's basically just getting the, the maximum efficiency of your equipment or even right plugins. It's still important that there's a certain. That could break that, that yeah. whole thing. You can have this whole system humming at its maximum mm -hmm. and decide, you know, 
it all sounds great, but needs some compression, let's say, because we're on that on that topic. And you put that compression in and just blow everything. You know, mm -hmm. you bring everything down too low, bring it. So it just ruins the high. quality of basically is that sure it, it now changes everything, mm -hmm. you know. Um and, and yeah, it's it's so important right to the end. It's like going through this whole process and you know, calibration is a very important thing to do. I have this piece of equipment, I'm now moving the signal to the next. Well, it makes sense that both of them match, right, the intensities, that you don't unknowingly apply signal to the next piece of machinery to record that's too intense or not intense enough. You've now compromised. Again, that whole chain thing has broken at the end. Mm -hmm. And it's a shame because you put so much energy into the whole process. Lots of times this happens without even knowing it's happening because you're not aware of the importance of unity gain. Mm -hmm. Great, great, great great response there mm -hmm. so uh last question what's I guess your number one piece of advice you'd give to a home studio producer um really um my 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 one piece of advice would be analyze analyze, analyze. you must listen to everything you do as an engineer you always want to get better and better so listen listen to what others do commercially and have that be a goalpost. Have that be something you look toward in, 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 in emulating. Because there's nothing wrong with emulating. There's nothing wrong with reverse engineering mm -hmm. and emulating something. Then you'll start finding right. your own identity and get better and better and better at it. But to kind of just record, not listen to what you do, not listen to what anybody else is doing out there, and be in your own bubble, uh, you're not going to mature. You're not going to grow mm -hmm. anywhere. Um, have your, be, be open to other suggestions. Be, uh, there are people that are going to give you suggestions and they've got motives that aren't honorable. Mm -hmm. Then there are people that are going to give you suggestions and they're from experience. Try to decipher those and learn from the positive ones and mature, become better. Because it's something I noticed in this industry that just is nonstop. I think it's part of what perpetuates me to continue mm -hmm. is this fresh, there's always something new. Wow, look at that, that approach, this approach. Um, boy, there's so many examples I can bring up, but it, there's, there's always something somebody's presenting to you that's a twist on what you've done already. Mm -hmm. So you got to kind of just change things up a little bit and learn from it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, analyze, be open to feedback, and just always be improving. So. Abs absolutely. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. It's a great interview. My friend. Great talking to you. Excellent. Thanks, Reagan. Hey, if you got value from this video, feel free to drop a like so more home studio producers like yourself can find this content. And again, remember, if you're looking for a proven step-by-step -step process for consistently producing pro quality music from home, then just grab my free rapid song finishing checklist in the description below. Also, if you're just looking for more tips and tutorials on how to produce pro level music from home, then just check out my playlist or video on the screen right now. All right, have an awesome day and keep creating.